Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to the webinar series on the hard team management of, trans or of mitral and tricuspid regurgitation treatment. My name is Nicolas van Miegem from the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam. And for this series, or for today, I will be joined by Professor Philippe Lourdes from the Leipzig Heart Center and Dr. Nicole Caram from the Centre Pompidou in Paris, France. Uh, today, we're going to focus on transcatheter mitral valve repair. And the objectives uh, of the session today is the following. We're going to discuss how what the importance is of minimizing residual mitral regurgitation following transcatheter mitral valve repair. And also we want to demonstrate transcatheter mitral valve repair devices and device iterations, how to achieve better procedural results and also improve long-term clinical outcomes. For this, we have, pre we have prepared a recorded case from the Leipzig Heart Center that we will discuss step-by-step -step with the panel. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Nicole uh, to present the Pascal system because this is the new device iteration, Pascal and Pascal ACE, that we will highlight in this webinar. Nicole. Thank you, Nicolas. So indeed, here we can see uh, the two devices, the two Pascal devices. Uh, one of them is going to be used during the case. So on the left of the uh, slide, we can see the initial implant that we used to have, which had a, uh, a central spacer that was uh, that enabled us to bring the leaflets rather on the spacer than directly together. And on the left of the, the right of the slide, we can see the Pascal ACE, which has a narrower profile and this is something that we're going to see later during the presentation. What is also new is the change in the uh, in the device in the stabilizer stabilizer. So here we have a stabilizer that is using a, a rail based system, and we have multiple stabilizers that are already implanted on the same rail rail system. It allows a more an increased stability and it's optimal for single operator use. And here we will see the, a more focused uh, image on the Pascal A. So here we have a narrower, narrower profile, so it's easier to uh, to navigate with. It has a smaller space a spacer, and it uh, it still has the possibility of separate grasping, which will allow us to uh, take one leaflet at a time or to optimize if needed. So here, just to so, show you one last slide where we can see the difference between the two devices. So on the top, we have the Pascal ACE, which is only six millimeters compared to 10 uh, with the initial Pascal implant. So Philip, let's go to you, what you have for us. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicholas. Dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to share now with you a life in a box case we prepared in that case, we use the Pascal system to treat a patient with degenerative mitral regurgitation. And without further ado, I suggest we jump right into the, into the case to have a bit of time for discussion later on. Welcome everyone to our hybrid OR at Heart Center Leipzig for Pascal implant to treat mitral regurgitation. I'm Philip Lertz, cardiologist, and I have with me my dear friends and colleagues, Thilo Noack, cardiac surgeon, and Christian Besler, Cardiologist. We also have with us uh, Professor Jörg Ender. He's the head of uh, anesthesiology. He will take care of patients' GA, but most importantly, he will guide us through the procedure by performing the transesophageal echo. And without further ado, I'd like to ask Christian to present us the patient's details. Dear colleagues, the patient we are treating today is an 86 year old gentleman with a BMI of 23.8 kilogram per square meters. The patient is known for three vessel coronary artery disease and underwent coronary artery bypass grafting in 2005 with implantation of three grafts, the left internal memory artery to the LAD and two saphenous vein grafts to the right marginal uh, artery and the first left marginal branch. The patient has a profound cardiovascular risk factor profile and is a former smoker. And on lung function testing, uh, we saw uh, evidence of uh, COPD. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the patient is presented uh, to our hospital with progressive dyspnea on exertion. He's currently in functional class three. Furthermore, he was reporting intermittent orthopnea and light headedness. The patient is living independently with his wife in an own house and used to be active before the dyspnea worsened. A couple of months ago, he is, was riding on his bicycle and doing garden work. Next slide, please. Laboratory values were uh, okay. Um, hemoglobin level revealed a mild uh, anemia. EGFR was about 45 mils per minute and anti-pro BNP was elevated with 1,600 nanograms per liter. Echocardiography revealed preserved left and right ventricular function, and as you can see here on the transthoracic images, there's already evidence for degenerative MR, and we will see in a second uh, that this is due to a prolapse of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. The invasive coronary angiography revealed a good graft function 16 years after coronary artery bypass grafting, as, as, as shown here. Next slide, please. So overall, the risk evaluation for operative mortality revealed an SDS score for isolated mitral valve repair of 7% and the Euroscore 2 of 10%. The case of this patient was discussed in uh, our local heart team, and the decision, decision was made to treat this patient by a transcatheter approach, by an edge-to-edge -edge repair with use of the Pascal system. Thank you, Christian. Surgical perspective? Yeah, that's a typical patient with a uh, primary mitral regurgitation, uh, what we have seen in the uh, pre-op uh, echo very well. And due to the age and due to the status post um, coronary bypass surgery, I think it's a very good candidate uh, for the treatment with an edge to edge device. Thank you, Tilo. Okay, then um, we, we go to Echo. So, good morning, also from my side. Uh, with me, that's Sophia Skropolo and uh, Nicole, the anesthetic nurse. And I show you now the LV function, which was uh, previously reported, which is good. and. Then I switch to the recorded 3D of the valve the experience. You see here that prolapse at the uh, more lateral part of P2. Here, maybe a small indentation. You see ruptured cord here. We measured the width of the prolapse. In 3D, it's 1.8. In 2D, it's 1.6. And if we go to the so the color doubler, you see here the color flow regurgitation jet, which is not in, the, in that previously mentioned uh, indentation, just on the, at the prolapse. You see a systolic reversal through the pulmonary vein, and the uh, ROR measured by PISA was 1.3. The biplane vena contractor was uh, 10 millimeters. So for the, the echo. Okay, so it's clear that we see the, the heart team of Leipzig in action and their decision-making process. Nicole, how is that in your center? Is it similar that you have your surgeons and cardiologists discussing the cases together? Or is the decision already made up front by a cardiologist? No, actually in our center, in my center, it is organized as the, uh, we have a medical surgical heart valve unit that I co-chair with the cardiac surgeons. So all our discussions happen between a cardiac surgeon and interventional cardiologist. Of course, we have the echo people who are on board who are and the clinicians. We have uh, also uh, lots of contributions from the heart failure unit. So it's really a teamwork. And we also have a uh, referring geriatrician on board who all, all frequently help us in deciding for some cases. So, um, in, of course, there are some referring physicians who will send the patient for surgery or interventional cardiology. So we take that into consideration. But we all the files end up in the medical staff on mm -hmm. Monday, <laughs> and then we will decide yeah. whether it goes for surgery or interventional cardiology. Yeah, we have a we have a similar similar addition of a geriatrician to our heart team these days, especially for the more uh, for the elderly patients. And I think this is also important for the discussion for patients with primary versus secondary MR, because of course the risk profile 
tends to be more important when we discuss primary MR, because of course for secondary MR, there is not a good surgical option. Do, would you agree with that statement, Philippe? No, yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, and in that patient, he had previous cardiac surgery. He was advanced age. We, we had the surgeons um, on board during the discussions. And um, I think it was a straightforward discussion. Um, we both agreed that he's a good candidate for a transcatheter mitral repair. But only given if we achieve a good result, obviously, because um, as we all know, um, apart from the surgical risk, this can be nicely dealt with by mitral valve repair. And our surgeons normally, they end up with these um, repairs without any MR. So um, if we decide to, to treat it by transcatheter means, then we, we have to do as good as possible. And that means trying to bring it down to mild limits. Yeah. Will that also affect your decision of which kind of technology that you're going to apply? For instance, uh, more edge-to-edge -edge repair versus annuloplasty? Or do you only consider edge-to-edge -edge repair at this day and age? Yeah, I mean, we, we, are pretty, we are very much focused on, on edge to edge and not so much on And in, in that case, um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward because this is a prolapse case where you need some sort of leaflet technology to treat it. You won't get away with anuloplasty only. What's maybe interesting to mention is the width of the prolapse, which is 18 millimeters. This is far beyond what's, what's been mm -hmm. considered as as an okayish case when we look back to the Everest criteria, but this is, I guess, it's work in progress. And um, as you will see, we, we now have devices where we can where we can grasp the leaflets sequentially, so one after the other. And I think that also impacts on what what should be considered in terms of of um, a prolapse width, which can still be treated successfully by edge to edge repair. Yeah, I think it's clear that the original Everest criteria are a little bit outdated with these current device iterations. And probably, I mean, we're going to demonstrate, of course, what the, the current technology can do for us, especially with a separate grasping. And that, of course, affects how uh, efficient we get also in these degenerative MR cases. Nicole, in your practice, what would be the relative proportion of primary versus secondary MR for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, do you still do more primary? Um, sorry, secondary over primary, or is is there a 50-50? How is it in your center? Oh, I would say that we are around 50-50 right now. I mean, there's been uh, in France, it's a different issue because the reimbursement for secondary MR took some time to to reach us. So uh, for a long time, we were doing much more primaries than secondary, but now we are doing a lot of secondary and we have a big heart failure unit in our hospital. So this clearly provides patients. Uh, we are still st stuck to the 50-50, but I guess as I see the future, we'll probably do more functional in the upcoming days, but this is true related to our type of patients. So before we go to the case again, Philippe, one more question from the audience. Are there echo uh, criteria that would predict co uh, coaptation failure, that you will not be able to, to, uh, to perform an edge-to-edge -edge repair? Is there something that would still make you hesitant to proceed? I think that's difficult to answer because the, the development in the field is so rapid at the moment. There's so many device iterations and we, 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 we just start to use them and, and to increase our knowledge and experience. Um, so I, I, I find it difficult to put an exact number in terms of a flail extension or a prolapse whip where you would not think that um, successful grasping is possible. Um, so, no, at that point in time, I don't think so. Um, and some independent grasping is really a game changer in these uh, degenerative um, pathologies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. Let's move on uh, with the case and now focus on the transeptal puncture. So let's continue with the recorded case. So, the, the strategy would be here to, to implant the Pascal ACE device. Um, we assume at least two to end up with a satisfying result. Okay, so we, we punctured the right vein and could now start with the procedure. And obviously we start with a transeptal puncture. The position we are aiming for here would be sort of mid fossa, but more on the posterior side. 
Okay. With it this? Okay, so we start off in the SVC, we we come back under fluoroscopic and echo control. And now the needle jumps down into the into the fossa. We have a sort of mid position. <coughs> We can go to 4D, uh, um, 4 chamber view to do the measurement, please. So again, what we what we are aiming for here is four to three point five centimeters. It's from here to there, so it's yeah okay. three point four. That's not bad. Maybe because we do have a prolapse and have to pull up quite a bit, we should be a little bit higher. So I just turned the the needle a little bit posterior, which provides us with some more height. And what what's also very helpful here is to make sure that ideally you end up in the left atrium just above the medial commissure of the mitral valve. That facilitates steering later on and implantation of the Pascal. So if we could go to a 3D. Yes, of Let, let's first measure yes, sorry, the, the distance. So the, yeah, that is okay, 2.6, which is quite nice. And now we go to the 3D. So the idea here is to try to appreciate the, po the position of the needle where you, where you see the, the pointing within the septum and relate that to the position of the medial commissure and ideally the needle enters the left atrium just above the medial commissure. And here you see the, the medial commissure, and here you see the tenting of the needle. Okay, so that suggests uh, um, an ideal yes, position. position. Hmm. So this is a, a very nice demonstration how uh, the echo helps you and in the guidance of an, to obtain an optimal puncture. Uh, what is different from from my uh, experience is the also the experience with 3D imaging. Is this also uh, happening in Paris these days for the puncture, Nicole? That you also rely on 3D imaging? Oh, absolutely. I guess this is uh, this is luxury. I mean, we started our experience with the standard bicaval image and uh, then moving to the short axis and checking the distance from the aorta. But of course, at the moment where we want to cross, having the 3D echo and an overview of the left atrium is really a good a good option. It's a, it's luxury. You see where you are going. It's important when you have those floppy floppy septum where you don't know how far you are going. So this is. So this provides security for the patient and then a good view for us. So I mm -hmm. don't know if you are doing I, the same for so. So, so Philippe, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. So for for a concept of puncture, it would be sufficient to use an um, X-plane 2D only. But um, we, we we started to to add 3D as shown here, especially um, with increasing experience with the Pascal system, because we found that you can make the most out of it, out of the technology, if you make sure that you really enter the left atrium just above the medial commissure. Um, that additional control to get perfect alignment will facilitate the procedure greatly later on. We, we haven't done that um, previously, I have to say. Um, that's a, a, the latest um, addition to, to, to our protocol um, when, when we do these procedures, but um, it, it's worth to spend a little bit more time because it, it will make the procedure later on much faster and easier. Is the height of the puncture still so important? I mean, you, you can get away if you're a little bit too high, a little bit too low, but you have to introduce additional steps, which um, you, you don't have to if, if you get it right in the first place. And um, so I'd, I'd say that, um, yes, it is important. It is important to, to think a little bit about how you want to do the procedure and where you want to puncture, um, because also once you've done it, you hardly ever will redo it. <laughs> So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. even even if you if you um, decided for suboptimal transeptal puncture, you probably will go through the case and try to do it and and with all the obstacles because of that um, suboptimal transeptal yeah. puncture. Yeah. So Nicole, what is your strategy if we take one step back uh, in terms of heparin uh, dosing? Do you start with heparin before you do the puncture, or do you only give the heparin after the puncture and when you are? in the left atrium? 
Um, I actually give half of the dose after the initial femoral, femoral puncture, and then I I give uh, the other half of the dose after the transeptal puncture and after checking that the pericardium is still free of any effusion. But so basically, it's half a dose and then the second half. How do you do, how do you perform it in your center? Yeah, um, uh, so I, I only get a full dose after a successful puncture. And I must say, uh, in the majority of cases, it is a, it's a very fast uh, process. And we, we use the explain uh, concept. So we're not dwelling too long. Uh, if, we, if we see that we, are, that we have a nice position based on our uh, four-chamber view in terms of height, and then in the, in, the, in the short axis view away from the aorta, so posterior and with enough height, then uh, basically that would be our puncture, and then we would give uh, immediately the full dose. Is that the same thing in uh, in Leipzig, Philippe? We we changed the approach a little bit also because we we keep on training more and more people, and this is why the transeptal puncture can take a little bit more time. So we do it exactly the way now um, Nicole explained. But I think these are the two points. If if you if you're yeah. sure that you're gonna end up with a with a very um, straightforward transeptal puncture, it's fine to, to give heparin after after crossing the septum. If it takes too long, then it, it's it, I think it's it's better to have a little bit on heparin on, on board just to avoid any yeah. clocking. So I agree with that. Uh, so if it if it becomes more challenging, then also we sometimes stop, give uh, the fifty percent of the of the expected dose, and then continue with looking for the appropriate puncture. So. Uh, there is a little bit of a modification that from time to time you need to be aware of. Uh, do you sometimes use uh, more dedicated uh, new puncture methods, um, puncture technologies, uh, Nicole? No, basically we did try that for uh, just for, as a tr a just check if we would like to have the, those new devices. I, I think you are probably talking about the electric uh, cauterization. But um, for me, with what we have now, which is the simple transeptal puncture and in difficult case and gestures, uh, I'm in a hybrid room, so I just choose the electric uh, needle, needle from the surgeons. I guess for me, it's enough for what we have now. We don't see this much resistant cases. How about you? Well, well we use, there is new, new technology coming up uh, and we, we were trying here and there. So I think this, uh, I, what's the name, FlexPoint, I think is, uh, is, is quite an interesting new technology, very smooth, very easy to apply. Um, and of course, from time to time, we use the Bailey the Bailey's system, uh, which is the cauterization method. Um, but it's more expensive, so that is also something that you need to uh, consider as you uh, as you are selecting uh, your material. Philippe, you, do you have any more comments to give on that? No, I have no experience with these uh, more advanced techniques to do transeptal puncture. We 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 we, we use the yeah. conventional equipment, and we were able to to to. Um, yeah, get across in all cases. Yeah, well, and you know, these we are talking about accessories. So let's uh, let's proceed now with the uh, with the recordings, and now focus on the Pascal device. So the the device comes preloaded in an elongated fashion, just then loaded into the guide, and then we advance the device within the guide until we reach the end of the guide. As you can appreciate, again, on echo and on fluoroscopy. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So what we have here now is a three component system. The guide, the steerable catheter, and the implant catheter. The implant catheter with the possibility to steer the two clasp independently, which then allows for independent leaflet grasping. And these three components, they are held together by the new stabilizer with the, with the two um, um, stabilizing docking stations here. We then will continue to advance the device out of the sheath. Echo, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. So as said, the device comes in an elongated fashion. And once it leaves the guide, we can then start to, to close the device and thereby reduce the length of it, which then helps the steering and navigation 
within the left atrium. So you can see on fluoroscopy and on echo, the device is now closed. So the next step would be to steer down the device towards the tricuspid valve and mitral. towards the mitral valve and therefore we introduce some flex on the steerable catheter. All right, and now we are close towards the mitral valve. The next task is to make sure that we have an ideal trajectory Just the on the, in the two planes, a truly orthogonal 90 degree tra trajectory of the device towards the mitral valve. This is absolutely essential to, to place the Pascal exactly where we want it. So by turning the steerable catheter clockwise and counterclockwise, we move between anterior and posterior leaflet, as you can see on echo on the right view now. And by adding or removing flex on the steerable, we move from medial to lateral, as you can see on the left. Obviously, the other option to move from medial to lateral is to move in or out into the body with the whole system. We believe that we need two devices, which means that the first one goes in medially. We always go from medial to lateral, mainly because otherwise we would have shattering, echo shattering. Okay, so on the right side, you see the device would enter the left atrium a little bit shallow, so we try to be there more orthogonal, and this should be realized by adding some flex on the guide. All right, this is it's getting better now. If we move in and out with the implant catheter, we can imagine the, the travel of the de device later on once we cross the mitral valve. So on the right, it seems okay. On the left, it moves pretty much straight down. Not bad. Okay. As said, we we probably will need independent grasping, getting the anterior leaflet in first, and then secondly, the posterior. So next step would be to open the device, check the clocking, and make sure that we then remember which clasp is um, which one. Okay, so we open the device. Floor. On the floor, you can see that the device is open now, Close but the, the clocking is, is not correct. So I, I turn a little bit until we see the two paddles on echo. So you can see now. Okay, let's do the, 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 the classy, the, the anterior clasp moving up and down. And let's track the other one. And here you nicely see the posterior Okay, so the difficult task now is to remember which one is anterior and which one is posterior. Okay, so the idea is to implant the device in a 90 degree clocking towards the line of cooptation. So you can see that the device now is one o'clock to seven o'clock, but it should be 12 to six o'clock. So I, I start to rotate counterclockwise until I end up more or less 6 to 12 o'clock, which is realized now. So a nice demonstration of how to maneuver the Pascal system in the left atrium and 
Uh, it's clear uh, that, uh, Philippe, you're not only using it for mitral, but also for uh, tricuspid repair, uh, this technology. And it's good to have the surgeon on board to, to help you keep the focus on the right uh, valve system. Uh, but as you, as you are uh, advancing from the right atrium through the septum into the left atrium, because this is quite long if it's elongated, are you focusing then on the upper pulmonary vein, left upper pulmonary vein, or what is your target then? Because I can imagine that if you that you might interact with the walls of the left atrium. The, the direction while advancing should always be the, the right upper pulmonary vein, just to make sure that you, you not um, interact with the walls of the left atrium. Um, however, the distance is normally not a big problem because you can start closing the device and therefore will get some foreshortening even at the point where the device is not fully out of the sheath. So, yeah. and, and this is why it's normally not, not a huge problem. So you, you start to advance the device and start closing. And uh, as soon as you, as you close it a little bit and, and already gain some foreshortening, then you can, you can move out of the sheath in total. Unless you have, uh, um, you have large anatomies where this is not, not necessary at all. Yeah, so you clearly demonstrated also the handling of the device, of the, the, sever, the several parts of the system. But uh, what was demonstrated here was predominantly the X-plane imaging, not so much 3D. So, Nicole, uh, is that also your practice or would you, uh, at a faster rate, use 3D echo? Um. To be honest, compared to what, we, what we've seen here, I do use more 3D echo. And sometimes we just have the combined uh, 3D and then the X-plane on the same image. Where you lose in quality, you, you lose in quality, so you cannot use it all the time. But it's very helpful I, for what I see. So usually, most of the time, I want to get to the mitral valve. I prefer to have a 3D echo and then, again, see the walls of the left atrium. And uh, and then go to the intercommensurate view and the explain, um, but again it depends on the patient and on the visibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Philippe, you're you're obviously highly experienced with this. Um, do you often confirm the orientation of your device uh, by 3D, or is this a step that you don't regularly do and that you just focus on your explain? Normally, I focus on explain only. I mean, I get mm -hmm. the the last confirmation on 3D anyway, when we do the clocking, that's the time where you can also double check your trajectory. But normally I, I try to do everything with, um, in X-Plane. And once I'm happy with the, with the trajectory, I go to 3D, do the clocking, and if needed, then change the trajectory again. Yeah, yeah. And all, another important aspect of this particular case was that you already anticipated using two devices, and you, your recommendation was to start with the medial one first, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The main reason for that is that um, if, if you do otherwise, then you you might end up with more shattering caused by the device, and then it gets a little bit more, more um, difficult. And then also because that's just my, my my approach for, for the last years, um, I always start at medial and then, then go lateral enough. Um, I, I find that easier. Yeah. Are these artifacts typical for this technology or would it be for any kind of tier technology? Um, well, it depends a little bit. Um, when you use the, the, the Pascal, the larger device with a width of 10 millimeter, then you have a little bit more than what you see with the Pascal Ace device with a smaller device. And that the same then applies to, to, the, to the clip depending on which size you, you use it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nicole, is this also your strategy that uh, if you anticipate two uh, devices that you would start medial and vice versa, if you would think I can do this without uh, two devices and with, with only one device that you would really aim for a more center, uh, center position? Uh, no, absolutely. I do exactly what Philip said, which is to try to try to start with the medial and then go to the lateral. I guess in very, very few cases where we have a higher prolapse on the medial and less on the lateral, I might want to start on one side on the lateral. But most of the time, I guess like 90 percent of cases, I would go for the medial first and then the lateral if I know yeah. that I am going with good devices. 
Yeah, the neat part of the technology is, of course, that you can also attempt, right? If you are in doubt whether one or two devices would do the, the trick, then you can first start with your uh, first device, put it in the center, and then uh, assess the, the result. And if you're not happy, of course, there is this opportunity to reposition the technology. So it's not just a, a one-hit uh, one uh, phenomenon here. So that's also very important to acknowledge. But of course, the more experienced you get, the more you can anticipate that uh, one or two devices or even more devices uh, might be needed for um, uh, for the for a particular case. So okay, so let's uh, continue with the uh, with the recordings and now focus on the valve crossing and the implant of uh, the first Pascal. Okay, thank you. So the next step is to cross the the mitral valve, get the anterior leaflet on first, then the posterior. And we normally do that, especially in those challenging anatomies where we where it's it is utmost important to place the device exactly where we want you to do that within the breath hold. You can see on the left side that we are a little bit too lateral, so there are two ways to correct for that, either by moving the device or by having an end expiratory hold. So we now ask Jörg Ender to give us an end expiratory respiratory hold. Okay, will do. And let's see Good whether stuff. that moves the device medially, and it did, as you could see. So we now cross the, uh, the valve. We changed the clocking there a little bit. I have to correct for that, which I've done now. Here you can go again to, to 3D to make sure that the clocking is correct. So for that, we reduce the gain. OK. OK, I think I can go a little bit counterclockwise. But well, it should be yeah, fine. That's good. OK, thank you. So we go to, to explain. So what we see here is quite typical. Sometimes you get a little bit of shattering at the anterior leaflet. And when we have highly experienced echo skills here, there's very little Just shattering. But sometimes it helps to move in the probe a little bit. OK, so what I did here is, let's close the device a little bit. I moved into the anterior leaflet. Now we bring down the anterior clasp. Exactly. You can see the clasp on the right, the clasp bouncing up and down a little bit, which is a good sign. And then the next step is to concentrate also an echo on the posterior leaflet. So I move in a bit and over to the posterior. So before we, we close now, I think we have to check clocking again. Do that. OK, so go a little bit clockwise. Obviously, in that situation, when you have already one leaflet in, you can do only very subtle um, changes with regards to the clocking. OK, explain, please. We are still within the same breath hold. We do have a lot of time, but not, in, not in indefinite, obviously. And now we bring down the posterior clasp. All right, this is bouncing up and down as well, which indicates that there's a, a good chunk of, of um, leaflet in there. Before we close, we'd like to have um, simultaneous pressure tracings on screen as well. So you can appreciate that. Thank you. And now we do close the device. Entschuldigung, build in build. That's really wichtig. Okay, 
So we, we continue closing the device, and we hope that we see nice tension building up on the leaflets, but also a decrease in left atrial pressure, especially V-wave. And this is exactly what we have seen. OK, now breathing on, please. And now it's time to, to reassess everything thoroughly. So as said, uh, it's really important to, to treat the prolapse at the medial aspect as perfect as possible, because the next device will go in laterally. So if you have some residual MR there, that's fine. We can still deal with it. But it has to be close to perfect at the medial aspect, for sure. Which I think is the case. OK. So this is a prolapse in a dynamic valve, which means that most likely once we release the device, we will have a little bit more motion on it than, than now, still being fixed to the implant catheter. But what's nice with the Pascal system is that the connection between the implant catheter and the device is very flexible, which means that um, the, the result before and after release is pretty much the same, um, which helps in terms of predictability. OK, so the device is released. You see, as expected in a, in a prolapse case, on a fluoroscopy, the device is, is moving more than it was before. But it's, can I ask my? In a stable position. Oh, good. OK, so on, on th so this is a very nice view. On 3D, you see that there is still a relevant remaining prolapse at the lateral aspect. But at the position of the device, we have a nice tissue, tissue bridge and pretty stable conditions there, I'd say. Yes. yes. We look from the ventricular view as well. Several interesting demonstrations here. Um, we have to bear in mind that this is a primary MR case, so not a, not a secondary MR. So that might also affect how you use this technology. But what was interesting for me is that you immediately chose for a separate grasping. Is this something that you would have done also, uh, Nicole, rather than uh, trying to aim for a simultaneous grasping and then optimize your grasp? Um, probably in this case, because of the height of the prolapse, I would have gone for a, I would uh, immediately have attempted a separate grasping, I guess. Um, most, in most cases, uh, I try to try if, I try to start with a, a, a simultaneous grasping and optimize if needed. But I guess in this case, it would have been difficult to get a good grasp on both. So why not go immediately with a shortcut and go directly to the, to the separate grasping? Yeah, and this is this is probably also what uh, Philippe was mentioning earlier on. You know, these gaps uh, you had, we had these cutoffs uh, from the Everest days, but those are beyond us. With when you when you can do this separate grasping, uh, yeah, you know, your options are almost uh, unlimited. Uh, correct, mm -hmm. Philippe? Yeah, certainly much more options. Um, our default approach would still be simultaneous grasping because the, the potential downside of uh, sequential is that you might get the clocking wrong. Once you ha have one leaflet in and swing over to the other, it is very easy to distort the anatomy. So that's why our default approach would always be simultaneous grasping. Here, having said that, I was absolutely convinced that um, we will not end up with a result which is satisfying to do simultaneous, and that's why we did um, sequential um, as a first strategy. But as, you, as, you, as I've shown, we, we double-check the clocking once we had the anterior leaflet in and before we close the, the, the class for the posterior leaflet, because that's obviously that's important. Mm -hmm. So if you would, for whatever reason, be unhappy with how the procedure goes and, and you want to, to bring the device back up, can you briefly elaborate on the elongation of this technology and how uh, traumatic it is? Yes, so if you have a feeling that you, 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 you have to leave the ventricle and go into the left atrium to readjust everything and, and correct the pro uh, trajectory, which sometimes is the case, and uh, probably we sometimes do it too late because it's really helpful to, to reset everything and, and, and start from scratch, 
And with that device, you have the opportunity to, to elongate it in full, to have it in the same configuration as it comes when you advance it in the guide. Um, you just have to turn the, the, the actuator knob at the, at the end of the implant catheter, and thereby the device elongates. You make sure on echo that while doing that, that you do not interact with any other um, structures. But obviously, once it is elongated, it is much easier to get out of the, of the cords of the mitral valve. And as such, it is um, it is atraumatic, and th that's the, the 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 benefit of having the feature of elongation. Yeah, I think it's an important feature. Uh, another important feature that was clearly demonstrated is the continuous pressure monitoring. Is this something that you also use, Nicole, during those Pascal procedures? Yeah, in in all the mitral repair procedures, it's very interesting to see those uh, decreases in uh, pressure in uh, pressure spike when you when we close. We don't even always get this kind of drop, especially in some rigid uh, left atrium. But when we see it, it's a, it's very nice to see. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's an important signal that uh, these V wave yeah. modifications that you obtain with uh, with closures, and if if there is hardly any effect, then you may want to consider uh, another grasping or you know another interaction with your yeah. with your leaflets there. Uh, maybe a final uh, comment, uh, Philippe, on the breath hold. Uh, does this increase also the stability of the system that it that it will move less as you are entering the ventricle? Yes, it does, because you, you get less um, respiratory motion. As you've seen in that case, with an, with an um, expiration, the whole system moves medially. With an um, inspiration, it moves laterally. And um, by having an end expiratory hold, we first we, we can correct for the position, as we've done here, because we wanted to be a little bit more medial. And then also the, the, the change in medial and lateral caused by respiration is gone. And this makes it much more stable. And if the patient are um, prepped before and um, um, oxygenated well, then you have um, three to four, sometimes five minutes to do the steps as, as demonstrated. Yeah, and I, 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 I agree. This, is, this has been a very helpful uh, trick that we also applied after we have learned it uh, from, from the masters in Leipzig. So, okay, so let's, go, let's move on with the recorded case because there was another uh, Pascal to be implanted. Make sure that we are a little bit closer towards the first, to the first. Now we close, uh, we, we cross carefully, all the time checking on echo and on fluoroscopy. Okay, we are below. Mm -hmm. The clocking changed ever so slightly while crossing. We correct for that before we open. Okay. Now we can open the device, please. This is insane. Mm -hmm. Okay, 3D again. Yes. We make sure that the clocking is correct. It's, uh, it's 6 to 12, so that's fine. Thank you. We go to X plane, please. Okay. Everything is fine. Could be a little bit closer to, to the first one. And now we move up. The device into the valve. Trying to get the leaflets on. Probably do in the, uh, simultaneous grasping here. Can we, can we have a bit of a V shape of the device, please? So that means we have to close it a bit more. Okay. All right, on fluoroscopy, obviously we are close. I think we see that the prolapse is in. Yes. Okay, let's bring down the, the clasps. Okay, you can see that they are bouncing up and down. Again, indicating that we have more than enough leaflet tissue when we close the device. Also, checking on fluoroscopy. All right, it's closed. Breathing on and color on, yeah, please. On. Yeah. All right, I think we can do better. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so we have less color now. It looks better yes. now. 
because um, Tilo advanced the device in a little bit, and you can also appreciate on fluoroscopy that we are much more in parallel now. So we, the, the release of the tension on the system is quite important because it can change the result as seen here. In terms of color, I think we, we have a very good result. But as you can see on the, on the right side, the posterior leaflet is, is still a little bit floppy. And we also have to consider that normally in OR, it looks a tiny bit better than it does the next day. Um, so I think we can do even better. We, we had a bit of a discussion. And what we would like to do now is to do a single leaflet optimization. Leave the anterior leaflet where it is, but reopen the device, bring up the posterior clasp, and try to get even more in of the posterior leaflet. What we do now is we ask again for breath hold, please. Yeah. OK, breath hold is started. OK, then we, we open the device. All right. Okay. And we, mm -hmm. we bring up the posterior clasp. Okay. okay. Can we have a little bit more V shape of the device, please? And now I bring the The steerable catheter more, to, more towards posterior and move even further in. Okay, now bring down the. I'll bring up again, and I'm not sure whether we have more. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, close it. Yeah, it's a bit more. Okay, yes. This is even better. Breathing on, please. See in 3D hardly any regurgitation chat. Aber es ist hermodynamisch noch mal deutlich besser geworden. Ne? Jetzt von der V-Welle ist, obwohl wir haben auch einen schlechteren. Ne? Ja. ja, which is nice. Can we check for the pressure gradients? Okay. Gradient is not an issue here. That's fine. Can we see pressure tracings on the screen, please? So you can appreciate here that we have no relevant remaining V wave. We have, in general, low left atrial pressures. We certainly also brought down mean LA pressures, which is highly predictive for outcome. So this non irrelevant. Normalized pulmonary venous inflow. So yes. everything we can measure looks better or it looks very good. Yes. So at the moment we have triple MR, right? Yes. Yeah. Can we see the color? Yes. And what we have to point out that we have a blood pressure of 170 systolic blood pressure and 70 diastolic blood pressure, and I think that's less than trace. It's a very excellent result. OK, again, pressure tracings, please. Can we, can we show them? So here you can see the left atrial pressure at a systemic pressure of 170 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Um, this is all we could have hoped for. So the second Pascal deployment really nicely illustrated um, the, the power of grasping optimization. Um, it, is this a difficult procedure, uh, Nicole? Is this difficult from a, 
from a procedure execution point of view? Uh, it's not difficult, It's uh, but it is a very delicate phase of the procedure. I mean, with uh, optimization, you we have to remember that we have one leaflet that is already in and that we are moving to get the second one. And here the movement have to be very careful. And as said by Philip earlier, it, we have to make sure that the clocking is correct and that we are not twisting the valve and we are not tearing too much on the leaflet that is in. So technically, it's relatively easy to do. But it's, we, it has to be done with lots of care and a lot of uh, checking before starting the new, uh, the new grasping. Philip, in your practice, is uh, this optimization technique, is this um, more the norm or is it an exception in your cases? It, it becomes more and more normality. We, we really we, we use it more and more often because of the positive feedback we get. When we do it, we normally end up with a better result. And um, even if you think that you have both leaflets in nicely, and it's certainly sufficient to hold the device in place, you will find that if you do a single leaflet optimization and get one leaflet in a little bit more, that will also impact on, on the procedural outcome. Yeah, and, and, tiny, and tiny bits of additional leaflet tissue make, may make a big difference, of course, in the overall result. Um, Nicole, again, we saw also the effects on the, the invasive pressure monitoring. Uh, you saw the pressure really go down. Uh, would you also use this to monitor uh, your effect and to determine your strategy, to determine whether you need to proceed with leaflet optimization? Oh, for leaflet optimization, we could do it. I mean, if we are unhappy with the drop in pressure, we can decide to go for that. But most of the time to decide for an, for an optimization, it's rather the, the way the leaflets are moving in. Here we could see in this case that we had the posterior leaflet that was still a lot, too floppy. And this would have been the real argument for me to go for an optimization rather than the pressure per, pressure per se, even if it's a good yeah. indicator. Yeah, 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 good comment. Um, of course, this was a primary MR. Um, if we now briefly look uh, to uh, the two options that we have, we have Pascal, we have Pascal ACE. Um, Philippe, in your practice, if you compare primary with secondary MR, is one device more your favorite for primary and the other for secondary, or is there, that, that doesn't matter, the etiology? We have a certain preference to use the, the ACE um, in, in degenerative almost exclusively um, because the space is a little bit smaller, which means that you bring the leaflets closer together and thereby you have more, uh, probably a higher grasping force. And if you look at these prolapse or, or flails, it is important to bring the leaflets together and have an um, appropriate grasping force if you want to have a stable result. And this is why we almost always use a Pascal ACE in degenerative. In, in functional, I still think that the, the, um, the, the normal Pascal with a 10 millimeter whip is, is, is a good device, especially when you have very broad sheds in, in a, in a um, severely dilated um, um, mitral annulus. But the handling of the two devices is exactly the same. The handling of the two devices is the same, but they um, behave a little bit differently because obviously the, the larger device has, has a more, more um, surface to, to interact with. So that, that might be um, um, a potential downside. But then on the other hand, obviously the tissue bridge you um, create is certainly larger with a, with a, with a greater device. And, and that can also come quite handy in, in specific anatomies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think with that, I think it's time to wrap up because we're already almost 60 minutes in this uh, webinar. Um, I think we demonstrated with this recorded case, but also with our uh, discussion, uh, what Pascal technology can do uh, in uh, for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge -edge repair and for uh, and how you can treat degenerative mitral regurgitation with this technique. And uh, again, we also discussed the differences between primary and secondary MR. Make no mistake, this technology also works very well in uh, functional MR. Uh, there was a, a question from the audience about uh, is there any comparative trial ongoing between uh, the between the Pascal system and uh, its competitor, uh, the CLIP, the MitroClip? Yes, there is. Of course, it's ongoing in the United States where they're randomizing one-to-one 
patients to either uh, Pascal or uh, the MitraClip. Uh, again, we focused uh, not only on patient selection today, but also on how to obtain uh, a good transeptal puncture and then demonstrated how to deploy uh, a couple of Pascal devices in order to reduce massive uh, degenerative MR to uh, basically no residual MR. And this is definitely reproducible. So in uh, not, I mean, it doesn't take that long to uh, gain uh, enough experience to mimic the results that also uh, Philippe and Nicole can, uh, can manage to obtain in their practice. So with that, I think uh, I would like to thank Nicole. I would like to thank Philippe for their expert uh, opinions and educational uh, content today. I also like to thank Edwards Life Sciences and uh, PCR for these exciting webinars. And I thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.